Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I'm very happy that today we have John here from Write Later, and he's going to tell you more about uh, well about Write Later and the editor and how the company started. Great, thanks. So, hi, I'm John from Write Latex. We make um, at Write Latex we make tools to help authors. Um, so we make online collaborative authoring tools for scientists. So Write Latex started out as a sort of side project of mine when I was a postdoc a few years ago. Basically, I wrote it so that it would be easier for me and my collaborators to write papers together. Um, a few years later, we now have over 150,000 users all over the world, and we're not just about Latex. Um, we're actually changing our name to Overleaf, which is our new name. Um, because we're now about much more than just LaTeX. So what does it actually look like? Um, basically what we've got is on the left a rich text collaborative editing um, view for your manuscript. So you can write your paper there. And then on the right hand side is a real time preview of the final typeset output. Um, so a bit like on WordPress, how you can either write your blog using HTML or you can use their rich text editor. You can also turn off our rich text editor. And underneath is a fully fledged sort of LaTeX editor, as you might expect. So as you're all computer scientists, I'm not going to spend too much time on what LaTeX is. But basically, um, LaTeX is like a programming language that produces really nice typeset documents. Um, one of the advantages of LaTeX is that it sort of marks up all of the important stuff in your document in a semantic way, so that if you want to reformat your document, you can submit it somewhere else. And you just have to change a few parameters. You don't have to go through and manually fix everything up. So that's a much nicer way of doing it. But the problem with LaTeX is that you have to know how to code in order to use it. So the, what we're trying to do with the rich text mode is really to sort of make it possible for people who don't know LaTeX to collaborate with you. So to give you an idea of, of what kind of things the LaTeX editor does, um, you can do things like connect it to your online reference manager, like Site You Like or Zotero, or very soon Mendeley. So you can pull in your references from there and automatically use BibTeX then from that point on to do all the formatting stuff. So that's a, a big time saver. Um, we've also got features for reviewing. So we have a sort of version control system in Write LaTeX that lets you compare between versions of your project. Um, so, so like I added some stuff here and I deleted some stuff there. Um, we also recently introduced this commenting feature, so you can have a sort of discussion in your Write LaTeX document. Um, you just click the comment button, and then you can do that. So that's really useful if you're trying to get feedback on a document, especially if it's from someone who doesn't know LaTeX so much. Um, so that's kind of where Write LaTeX is at the moment. It's, uh, it's been a long and interesting journey. So by, by making it sort of easy to use and accessible, we've got a lot of users who are students, so people who wouldn't sort of ordinarily be using LaTeX. Um, it's a great way to learn LaTeX, because you don't have to worry about all this stuff to install, like which of the different flavors of LaTeX do I use, all that stuff. So we have a lot of users who are students. And we also, those range right up to people who are doing actual research. So if you write a paper on Write LaTeX, one of the other things that we do is we make it really easy for you to publish your paper onto somewhere else. So we've got partnerships um, with F1000 Research and PeerJ, which are open access publishers doing cool stuff in the life sciences. Um, we also connect with sort of data repositories and preprint archives, so you can ship your stuff out of Write LaTeX very easily. Um, you can also publish on Write LaTeX, which is really useful if you have a template, like if you run a, a conference and you have a particular LaTeX template for your proceedings, you can publish that to our gallery. We've got like 500 community um, contributed templates now. So. That's also a really good thing you can do with Write LaTeX. Um, and interestingly, with F1000 Research, they not only accept submissions via Write LaTeX, but we're now sort of starting to do more with them so that their editors can actually come and do the sort of back and forth with you um, about your paper. Like, do you have all the references in the right format? And you know, is it, is it all to spec? Um, they can actually do that on Write LaTeX instead of having this process where you submit and then you have to go back and forth sending files around. So that's really about streamlining not just the writing process, but also all the stuff that happens after that. So we think that's quite exciting. And it's a big part of where we're going with um, what we're now calling Overleaf. It's about bringing not just the authoring process into the cloud, but also more of the other sort of scientific process that your document goes through. So you know, it goes through peer review. Um, publishers do things, interact with it to get it ready for their sort of distribution systems. And you know, finally, um, <coughs> you can have people actually read your documents on Write LaTeX. So that's really where we're, we're sort of aiming this now. It's about bringing science, bringing more of the scientific process into the cloud and into the open. And that's not just 
good because it saves people time because you don't have to send documents around and waste a lot of time formatting stuff. And I think it can also really facilitate making science more open so that not when you publish something, it isn't just a, a few pages that you get to, to publish at the end. You can actually back that up with a lot of data and code and the whole history that you went through to actually get there, which makes it a lot easier for people to build on what you've done. So that's, that's the big vision for Overleaf. That's what we're working on. Um, we started in a, a much more humble way, so I'll go back to our story. So um, the first sort of, I would, I would put the start date on Write LaTeX in 2009, actually, so um, quite a long time ago. I was a postdoc in engineering maths at Bristol, and basically we were using this service called Etherpad to write our papers. So um, that was like a collaborative online editor, and then I wrote a bunch of scripts that would like pull the stuff off of Etherpad and compile it and stick the outputs back on Dropbox. And it was kind of crazy, but it worked. Um, so that, that we actually used that for quite a few years um, until Etherpad got bought by Google and then shut down. So um, Etherpad, what we liked about Etherpad was that it was really low sort of overhead. You just clicked a button, you didn't have to sign up or anything, and then you could just write in text formats. So we used to just write our LaTeX markup there. But of course, it didn't do anything like syntax highlighting or figures or uh, really anything that you would want from a LaTeX editor. So that was kind of the idea. Um, so once I finished my PhD and I, I found myself with a bit of um, a, a desire to do something slightly different for a while, um, I coded up the first version of Write LaTeX, which was basically um, the same idea. You don't have to sign up, you just click a button and it drops you into the editor. Um, so there's a real-time collaborative editor on the left and then a preview um, on the right of the document as it was compiled. So um, basically, I, I put that out there as a project, and I used it with some friends for a while. Um, and nothing really happened with it for about six, six or seven months. Um, and then one day, one of my friends um, posed a math question on Facebook, as, you know, as your friends all do, I'm sure. Um, and I decided to do a little LaTeX notebook that sort of solved it. It was quite a simple Newton's method sort of thing. And I put a nice graph in there. And he thought that was really cool. Um, so he put it on Hacker News. And then thousands of people um, started using Write LaTeX, which was cool. So um, that's us there at number eight, although I think we did eventually get a bit higher than that. So um, at that point, I guess I started to take Write LaTeX a bit more seriously because I had lots of people asking me for features, and um, it, was, it was getting to sort of overwhelm all of my other things. Um, at that point, I, I found um, one of my colleagues who was also interested in sort of startup stuff, and I convinced him to to join, so he's also called John, John Hammersley, he's now my co-founder. Um, and we, we started working on Write LaTeX in our spare time together. Um, we didn't quit our jobs for quite a bit longer after that. Um, at the, around this time, we applied for Y Combinator, so they're the, the sort of early stage incubator that, um, that runs Hacker News. Um, we actually got an interview with Y Combinator, but didn't get in, unfortunately, so uh, we, we sort of Again, it went into one of these kind of quiescent periods where we didn't do a lot. It was still growing quite quickly, um, not due to anything that we were doing, but just basically word of mouth. Um, a bit later in, so I guess this was early uh, 2013, so um, actually it was Valentine's Day 2013, which was interesting. We ended up getting slash dotted, um, so that was very exciting. People say that Slashdot is maybe a bit past its peak, but it was still, still quite large, um, and I think we doubled in in about a month after slash dots. So that was quite, quite good. Um, I think also at this, this was sort of the time when we started to notice that Write LaTeX was spreading beyond where we thought it, maybe where we thought it was going to. So like people who weren't necessarily LaTeX geeks were starting to use Write LaTeX and it was starting to be used in a lot of interdisciplinary collaborations. So we started to think that, that maybe this is actually quite a bit bigger than what we were thinking it was. So we started looking at investments. Um, again. So this time we applied, um, we, we found out through a friend about this program called Bethnal Green Ventures. So they're a sort of a Y Combinator style accelerator based here in London. Um, and they look for businesses that not only have a sort of business case, but also have a, a positive social impact. Um, so for us, we thought that was a good fit because we believe strongly that if we can make Write LaTeX into a really good cloud-based tool, um, it's not just going to be more convenient, but also can really change how we do science. So um, long story short, we got into Bethnal Green Ventures. Interestingly, they're not based in Bethnal Green. They're based in Holborn, but 
I didn't know anything about London at the time, so that didn't seem odd at all. Um, so anyway, through, through Bethnal Green Ventures, we, um, we sort of continued to develop um, the idea, and we continued to grow. Um, I think we were, we were still growing very quickly back then, um, like sort of 10% 10, 10 a week sort of growth, which means that you double every couple of months, which definitely keeps you on your toes. Um, so we, I think a lot of what we did at Bethnal Green Ventures was really aimed at at getting the sort of story around the product rights and also teaching you how to talk to um, later stage investors. So they introduced us to another investor called Digital Science. And I have some stuff from Digital Science, which I'll hand out. Um, they're pretty cool. Um, basically, Digital Science is the venture arm of Macmillan. So they, they invest in early stage sort of science related startups. And they've, uh, as of this summer, just gone past invested in us. So we've now um, joined them. And we spent most of the summer um, trying to sort of build up our team and really start taking things to the next level. So that's, that's been very um, exciting. So yeah, um, that's, that's sort of the, the background on the business side of things. Um, to give you an idea of, of the sort of technical side of things, because you know, you're computer scientists, um, we, we run on a pretty conventional stack now. So we're Ruby on Rails. Um, we are hosted, so this sort of the main web application is hosted on Heroku, which is a platform as a service that makes it quite easy to run your um, Rails apps and things like that. Um, we store most of the data in Postgres, which is an open source uh, relational database, um, which I, I strongly recommend. It's very good. Um, and in the editor, um, we use an open source component called Code Mirror, which handles a lot of the syntax highlighting. And we've also built a lot of the rich text sort of features um, up on top of Code Mirror. So that's, those are the sort of core technologies on the, the main web application side of things. Um, running LaTeX is, is an interesting one. So LaTeX, as I said, is basically a programming language. So if you run, if someone sends you a LaTeX file and you run it on your computer, um, you should be a bit worried about running somebody else's code, especially if it's a random person on the internet who sent you this file. So we have to worry about um, security and containerization when we, when we do those compiles. So we, we're now using Docker, which you've probably heard of because they're generating a lot of buzz. Um, it's a very sort of lightweight containerization technology that lets you run applications in a sandbox. So basically what we, what we have is a Docker image that's got all the scientific software that you need on it, like TechLive for LaTeX, and also some plotting tools like GNUplot and, and, um, and increasingly other things like Python and R are going into that image. Um, and then every time we want to compile a document, we spin up one of these Docker containers, we run your compile inside that container, and then when it's done, we throw it all away. So because you're in the container, you can't do things like talk to the internet and send spam or or um, escape from the container and, and cause problems. So that's, um, it's really fortuitous that that technology came along because uh, it's, it's really quite impressive how fast Docker is at making that process. So that whole process of like creating a container and then throwing it all away only takes, it's like less than 100 milliseconds. So it's, it's quite um, impressive how it works. Um, and there are other alternative technologies like LXC and things like that as well. Um, but Docker really does make it very easy. So um, Docker is very cool. Use Docker. On, on the, uh, they don't pay me or anything. I just think it's cool. Um, on the sort of other technical clever bits that we do. Um, so if you're ever curious as to what powers things like Google Docs and how it does that real-time collaboration, the, the sort of underlying technology is called operational transformation. Um, and it, it's basically a protocol whereby you send changes between different servers. Instead of sending the whole document, you just send little diffs. And there's a process by which you can make sure that when you send, when everybody has sent all the diffs, everybody agrees on the final state of the document. So we, we actually ended up writing our own OT code, but um, there are lots of libraries now that, that do that. Um, and it's quite an interesting um, bit of work. And there are many different flavors um, with different sorts of trade-offs in terms of time and space. So it's, it's quite an interesting area. Um, the other thing that's, that's a little bit clever that we do is we take, um, so the real, in order to ship the document back to you when you do the real-time preview, um, it would be quite slow if we sent the whole document back every time you typed something. So when we run the compile, um, we then check to see which pages have changed, and we use a content addressable hashing scheme to, um, to, to make sure that we only send the changed pages back to the client. 
So that's another little bit of computer science that, that we use. Um, we also, I guess you probably the, the main place you would find content address addressable storage now is, of course, Git, the version control system, because it hashes everything. So we actually ended up using a, a very similar sort of technique um, to do the real-time preview. Uh, yeah. So while I'm here, um, if you're interested in sort of open access and open science stuff, we're actually running an event somewhere at Imperial. Um, you can find out the details on this link as soon as they're confirmed. So that would be a, a good thing for you guys to go to. Um, we also run a community event called Future Pub, as in Future Scientific Publishing. And the next one of those is uh, in January. So um, keep an eye out for that. Yeah. So. That was um, pretty much all I was going to say. Very happy to take questions, talk about anything else um, that you're interested in. Thanks. At the moment, yes. So it's, it is building, rebuilding your figures every time you compile. Um, so you can call out to things like Python and, and maybe soon R, um, which I like. Um, and you know, that's, that's a part of, that's um, one of the, the nice things about that is that the data behind the figure and the code for the figure are both there in the project. And so it's much more transparent. It's not just, you know, here's a graph. It's here's the data. Here's how we produce the graph and getting that into the final product. So that's something we're still working on, but I think it's a really good thing to do. In the sort of abstract for this talk, uh, you mentioned bugs, lots of bugs. So uh, are there still lots of bugs in the data? Yes. So these, these are not bugs in right LaTeX, I should say. Um, no. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd say that what I sort of was driving at there, and I'm glad that you asked, because I wasn't going to bring up all of our bugs. but. Um, but basically, we, we built on a lot of open source tools, and it's interesting how, just how many, how sort of underspecified they are. So it's not it's not that they're all full of bugs. It's just that the um, the behavior isn't always what you expect. So to give you some examples, um, we we have an interesting bug whereby our web servers, occasionally, like it's very rare now, but. They just stop processing things. And no one has ever, I've never worked out why that is. It seems to be something quite low level. Um, why does that happen? These are all these sorts of challenges that you get. I'd say also um, LaTeX particularly is, is um, quite interesting to make it compile things correctly. So we use um, a package called LaTeX MK to actually do the LaTeX compilation, which I, I certainly recommend it. Um, but it is like a 10,000 line Perl script that somehow manages to compile LaTeX documents. <laughs> and so that, that does introduce challenges when somebody says, my project doesn't compile, um, because you have to figure out where in that enormous mess of stuff is, is actually gone wrong. So I guess um, bugs are kind of a fact of life. And it's really interesting how you sort of you see that 80-20 rule where you can get something that works most of the time, but then when you start to push the edge cases, you find that things are are not as reliable as you might have thought. <laughs> yes. Um, as far as I know, or can I understand, your uh, versioning and, and right left is very explicit, right? You, you create new versions yourself. Have you ever looked into doing this automatically, like Google Docs or Google Docs? Uh, yes, so we, we do now have a sort of file history um, button that you can click and you can get a sort of timeline view of all the changes. And we're still working on sort of extending that further back in time. But yep, I think that's, that's definitely a good thing is to be able to go back in history. I still think it's a good idea to be able to save versions of things. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, of course, we, we want it to kind of both because yep. pushing it into the cloud always gives you the safety of knowing you can go back and forth. Right. Um, yeah, I think so. Another thing we're actually working on with some students here at Imperial is a sort of Git bridge between Write LaTeX and and Git, um, and that will will hopefully sort of unify that idea of saving a version is the same as committing it into your Git repo, and then you can um, push things to Write LaTeX and pull them back again. And I think that'll be quite a nice um, extension of what we've got. So. To what extent can you kind of design a whole document? 
Yeah, that's a good question. So um, our sort of philosophy with the rich text editor is that, that you should be worrying about your content when you're using that. So that's, that's more of a, you know, writing a manuscript, not worrying so much about how it looks. Um, so we're, we're definitely targeting a very sort of thin layer over top of LaTeX. So it parses the LaTeX code on the client side, and it just picks out important tags like section and citations and um, the sort of the more semantically important bits, it doesn't get into like multiple columns or the margins have to be this big. We want to try to push that into more of the templating step. So the, the sort of goal for the rich text mode is to make it so that you can write your content in the rich text mode and then you can switch to LaTeX mode to do the final formatting if you want to. Um, in many cases, when we talk to publishers, they prefer that you don't spend a lot of time um, sort of fiddling with the spacing on the margins and all that sort of stuff. Because the first thing that they do when they receive the submission is usually to send it to someone in India who then re-keys it all anyway. Um, so they don't particularly mind um, what you, how it looks. Yeah, um, yeah so that, that's a really good question. Um, actually getting the rich text mode to work is, is a lot of work. Um, LaTeX is, is not an easy language to parse. And of course, you can never parse the full Extent of LaTeX because LaTeX is, is actually Turing complete. Even like the first little bit of it is that actually is just the preprocessor is Turing complete. So you, you probably don't want to be parsing that um, in your text editor. Um, so what, what we're definitely aiming for there is to kind of identify a, a subset of LaTeX that works, that's expressive enough to do most of the things you would want in a paper, but doesn't get into all the crazy stuff that LaTeX does. So hopefully that's, that's going to save some headaches for everybody involved. Uh, but that's, that's definitely still something we're working on. That's a good question. So, um, yes, yeah, so Write LaTeX is a freemium product. So you can do pretty much everything for free, but we do charge for some extra features, um, like better access control, so you can say exactly who can access the documents rather than just relying on a secret link. Um, and also more sort of version control and version history stuff is, is currently in the paid plan. Um, with Overleaf, we're, we're looking more at um, making more of it free for, for authors and charging more at an institutional level and at a, a publisher level as well. So we've got a number of trials going on um, along those lines now. Yes. We've been uh, we've been playing with those. Um, there, the ASMJS version is called TechLiveJS. It's it's a very cool thing. Um, it's quite slow though, um, so we've had we had some performance problems. Um, but getting some of the other bits of the tool chain, uh, maybe to do with BibTeX or SyncTeX into the client, I think is is something that might work much sooner. Um, so yeah, definitely we're interested in in reducing the amount of stuff that we have to ship back to servers, because um, that can really can really tie it together a lot nicer. But uh, yeah, still very much an, an emerging thing, I think. Okay, uh, I think we've got your questions. Um, let's, let's, let's thank John again. Yep.